John Rob here intervene. Uh, the legendary Martin Brahma found a member of the fall, of course, the main driving force in the Blue Orchids. So uh, what are you currently up? Right now I'm working on new material for the next album. But um, in fact, today we'll be announcing the release of the album that's currently ready. So uh, our label, Tiny Global, will be announcing that later today on social media. So that's, that'll be called uh, Speed the Day and it'll be out in about four months, I think. And, and where does this album take you? Is it are you still working within the parameters of what you do and what you like doing, or are you are you pushing the fabric a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I was pushing the fabric. Yeah, uh, we recorded this one in uh, Longsight in Manchester in July, and uh, yeah, it's a bit more. Um, it's got more of a, a live feel, a bit more um, discord in there. You know, it's a, it's a good solid album. I'm really pleased with it. I mean, it's, it's a Blue Orchids album for sure, but, you know. Yeah, but there's, there's, there's certain hallmarks of what you do, which are great hallmarks, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, do you, I mean, with, with music, for you, is, is it a matter of stripping it down to a core constituent of things that just really, really work? Yeah, well, I've always liked to avoid uh, rock cliches from my, my early days of writing. Um I like to work fast in the studio, so like we recorded this album in three days, you know, voc- vocals, everything. It was uh, no overdubs apart from the vocal. So we played live in the studio, and that's been fairly standard for all the my recent albums, you know, and early ones. <laughs> there was a gap in the middle where it took a bit longer, but <laughs> is, is is that something just instinctively feels right for you, or, or do you? I mean, some people actually have rules, don't they? This we just don't do this. Or is it just, just, you just don't do it because you just don't feel that's the way you would do it? That's the way I learned to record, and that's the way I've found I'm happiest recording. I mean, the, you know, the first time in the studio, more or less, was uh, doing John Peel sessions, where you've got a day or an afternoon to record four songs. I mean, you've got good quality equipment, but you've got to work quickly, yeah. And there's uh, not a lot of time for um, leaving your options open. You've got to make decisions and, you know, run with it, work with it. And um, I, I, I'm still more comfortable working that way. I don't like to sort of sit there with loads of takes and uh, loads of different parts and then having to hone it all down. I'd rather just, uh, you know, strike quickly and just live with what I've got. You know. So it's, it's, it's purely on instinct. You, you know you know when it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I, I, always, I always look at the drummer. When the drummer thinks he's got a good take, we'll go with that. We can fix anything else we need to do. <laughs> yeah. So we've got a good drum take. That's a two or three t- takes. We've usually got a good drum take. You know. has, it, has, has it been frustrating not getting the recognition that you, you should have been due? Or, or are you quite happy sitting kind of on the sidelines, mm. sort of shout, shouting at the mainstream in a sense? Yeah, I'm happy where I am. Um, I mean, it's a mixture of both, really. Obviously, it's it'd be nice to have a bit more recognition, I suppose, but I'm kind of used to my position in the... You know, music and world, so, so to speak. Yeah, you know, the important thing is to, uh, I'm getting products out there, you know, getting music out there and people can uh, buy it if they want it, you know. Um, it'd be nice if more people were buying it, you know, that's always good, isn't it? But I do it because I enjoy doing it and uh, so I'm, I'm pretty happy, you know. I get, I get a fair bit of recognition from, uh, you know, serious music lovers. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Take it seriously, yeah. so that's important. I mean, is that kind of is that kind of part and parcel of it of what you do as well? That you know, to to almost you know, some of the songs you've written are great pop songs, but they're almost like deliberately not put into a pop environment, mm. aren't they? You know, it's is it you know is, is that something yeah. is that something that's well, been important um, to you? I mean, I like pop music. That's what I, I grew up on. So that's kind of what I'm writing. Whether it's how popular it turns out to be is another matter. But that's opportunities. You know, you, to, to have a, a pop hit, you need to be, have a major record deal. You need, you know, how it works. I've always been with little indie labels. Um, you know, so I've got a, a niche. But I mean, like, say some of them are probably quite accessible if they were pushed into the mainstream. But uh, push is not forthcoming. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably difficult to work with on a, in a business sense. Uh, I, I don't want to be famous, you know. I, I walk away from things when it seems a little bit um, controlled. I've always been like that. Not necessarily consciously. I just get, if I get a bad feeling, I, I kind of just uh, 
swerve it, you know, as often as <laughs> for whatever reason. Because I mean, it was a point in time when the Blue Orchids first came out and you, you just seemed that you'd be like the next band. You know, the, the, all those bands come out of the Northwest, like the Bunnymen, etc. It just seemed like yeah. you were going to be in that space, but it just seems... Mm. Well, to me, yeah. it always seemed like it was probably quite deliberate not to go into that space, though. <laughs> it was, yeah. I mean, you know, my own uh, mad way. I, I didn't want to be a you know, commercial pop star. Uh, and um, also, you know, it was, it was a difficult um, time in the early 80s. There was... Uh, so many, so much, uh, you know, drugs around and stuff. So we were all pretty crazy, you know. And uh, <laughs> you know, I think when opportunities were there, maybe uh, I was in the wrong st- state of mind. It didn't look like a safe bet to uh, big labels. You know, I've had some major A and R men come and see the band in the early eighties, and uh, sometimes I'd be experimenting with the wrong drugs, and <laughs> so it didn't look like a, someone you'd want to sign, you know, <laughs> give a lot of money to. So. I've never been an addict. Yeah, but even dabbling could be enough if you're, if you're, if you're on a different, slightly different planet. If the yeah. timing's wrong, yeah, there, there, were certain, there were certain gigs I'm thinking of, but I don't want to go into details, obviously. But <clears throat> yeah, you know. And the, I mean, a Rough Trade kind of wanted me to move to London at one point and um, work with more uh, organised musicians, you know, people who had to act together. And I went to stay in Manchester with... Uh, people I was used to making music with who were pretty out there because of all the drugs and stuff. So, uh, you know, again, it's like people didn't want to take that chance on us, I think. When they saw us close up, it was like quite chaotic, you know. <laughs> but that was good for the music. Um, you know, we were doing it for our, you know, for whatever reasons. Our reasons were never to be a commercial success, so I guess that's why we never were a commercial success because mm-hmm. it's, it's hard to achieve that. And if you're not even trying to achieve that, it's, <laughs> you're not likely to, are you? So... Well, I mean, well, that time is it was it kind of a more hallucinogenic kind of uh, mindset that you would have? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first drug I took when I was sixteen was LSD. You know, so it was in the deep end. So that was a quite mind altering uh, mm. microdot acid that was going on the clubs in Manchester. So um, yeah, so so I expected a lot from drugs, given that was my first experience. You know, I thought, oh, well, you know. All drugs wouldn't be that profound, but you yeah, know, everything is, is like LSD. <laughs> so, yeah, but <laughs> I mean, it's, that's it's, why we're it's, a little bit out there, obviously. I think what's interesting that what you was your early work with the fall and with Blue Orchids is it was kind of creating a new kind of psychedelia. And it wasn't 60 psychedelia, this is not a paisley shirt psychedelia, it's a very stark, almost monochromatic psychedelia. So how, how yeah. did it end up being like that if you're taking the right drugs? Is it the right drugs in the wrong place? <laughs> mm, well, you could say that. Well, we, we weren't imitating the style of psychedelic music mm. uh, to us, in, our, you know, in my state of mind. All music is psychedelic, you know. When, when you're out there, <laughs> all music is psychedelic. <laughs> so um, so I, didn't want the, I didn't want the cliches of 60s psychedelia, but I did want to make this head music, you know. Uh, so we had, uh, I worked to get rid of cliches, as I said, you know, including psychedelic cliches. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was definitely um, I had a sense of a northern psychedelia. It was, it's, yeah. it was, it, it was, was kind of great. now. It, yeah, it's about being present in Manchester at that time. It was about now, you know, the psychedelic moment now <laughs> from Manchester's point of view. So, mm. yeah, just trying to strip I mean, away anything but the, the now, you know. I mean, in many ways, the work you were doing then was the first big reinvention of psychedelia into a different, very different form. Yeah. But at the time, you wouldn't be aware of that, would you? You'd just be teenagers, mm. kind of, I imagine, pretty fucked up, snarky, crazy teenagers just playing music <laughs> in an altered state. Yeah, well, that's right, yeah. Um, we, we kind of were aware. Uh, it seemed significant to us what we were doing. You know, we thought it was important. We, we thought we had something to say. We were, we were kind of aware. We had some kind of a precognition that this was significant. I mean, we were full of ourselves, you know. We thought we were uh, better than the rest, you know. So that's why we went to make music. We thought most music was pretty crap, and we could do better, you know. We could contribute something. It's, it's kind of interesting because in that kind of because you started pre-punk when it's seventy four, seventy five, seventy six, sort of dabbling yeah. in, in music. It's a completely different mm-hmm. Manchester then, isn't it? I mean, to, mm-hmm. to actually put music together then. There's, there's 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 nothing in the city to hold on to, is there? There's there's just nothing there at all, was it, at the time? 
No, no, there wasn't a scene in Manchester, really. I mean, not as far as we were concerned. I mean, there, were, there was like 10cc or the tremolos and the Bank of Sad Cafe, but they were kind of, you know, very kind of mainstream, conventional bands that had minor hits, but it wasn't a Manchester scene. And we didn't like that kind of music anyway. So um, we were listening to a lot of American music, a lot of German music, I think. Uh, some of the stuff coming out of Hub Rock, like Dr. Feelgood, were quite important, I think. But um, um, yeah, it was, it, Matt, that, as I said, as probably said before, you know, Manchester was kind of, um, we had access to what's going on in New York, what's going on in London. Uh, or Berlin through the media, you know that you know that there were like three music papers a week just filling you in on what was going on in music. So we, we were kind of up to up to date and up to speed, but um, we didn't have our own identity. You know, it's about Manchester was like to do with the industrial revolution and you know working in factories and just, you know there was no music really apart say from these uh, mm. kind of almost cabaret type pop bands. You know, so uh, yeah, so we knew we wanted to do something. Um, it was up to speed with what we were reading about in places like coming out of New York or London. Uh, but we went to put our own stamp on it, make it original, you know, which is what we kind of tried to do. This is this is like in Presswich, wasn't it? Yeah. You grew up in Presswich, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did, did that, was that I moved there when I was about seven. So did, did Presswich have a different kind of vibe from other North Manchester suburbs? Was it was a or was it just the same everywhere? Or was there a few more kind of heads around there? Yeah, well, I, mean, I moved there when I was like seven years old. So my early years were in Openshaw, which is East Manchester, which is like um, two up, two down terrace houses. They, they all got pulled down in the 60s, like slum clearance. But uh, my, my mother uh, remarried when I was seven and we moved to Presswich anyway. And that was like a, it always had a village feel. feel. It, was, it had its own identity. It was called Presswich Village. Mm-hmm. And it had its boundaries uh, still, although it was, it was in a suburban sprawl by then. But it, it still had an identity. It was Presswich Village. And it kind of Presswich ended up a style lane for historical reasons, and you know, so it had a, a definite identity. And um, yeah, you know, they were, well, they were heads. Yeah, they've got a few old hippies around there and stuff. <laughs> I mean, could, trouble making, as we were. yeah, because you're sort of in between the two generations, aren't you? You're, you're 63 now, I think. Is it 63? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you're kind of too young for the hippies, and, and not well, not too old for the punks, but you're kind of in between the two. Kind of musical we generations. Too, yeah, I went to we were two old punks. Uh, we, were, we were punks for about six months or something. But, yeah. Um, yeah, they were, yeah, the hippies had already done that thing. And like I say, when I first took LSD, that was thanks to the hippie scene, obviously. So we were kind of um, second generation hippies, or, or we saw ourselves more as. Um, we just, you know, we had long hair and leather jackets. We were kind of like Manchester Ramones and that in our look, I suppose you might say. Before, <laughs> yeah, everybody had long hair and leather jackets then. So, uh, yeah, we were kind of just in the biker scene, but didn't have bikes, you know, listening to heavy rock and, and get yeah. out in the various clubs in Manchester, like Waves was a, a kind of biker, biker club. Played a lot of hard rock. And uh, there was a pub called The Crown, a Bollington's pub. that had a great jukebox um, near Victoria Station. And uh, that was kind of where all the Hells Angels went in North Manchester. So we we going down there, down Velvet Underground on the jukebox and stuff like that. So it was it felt like you it was kind of quite a cool scene. And that was before punk rock, before the Sex Pistols came to Manchester. It's kind of like that, you know. And the greasers, exactly. I think we call that called them then more than bikers. You know. So it would be would it be stuff like Black Sabbath, Groundhogs, and yeah, those kind yeah. of bands? Yeah, sort of Edgar informal. Broughton band, you know. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. the big names, and, and yeah, and they were all they'd all come through Manchester and play like Free Trade Hall or the Apollo or whatever, you know, the mm-hmm. Theatre the Royal was that one, anyway, you know, the big theatres. So we'd see all the national tours of the big heavy rock band, you know, Alex Harvey band were, were great live, saw them in Manchester a few times. Went to loads of uh, gigs, we had the habit of uh, being able to kick in the fire doors at the back of the Free Trade Hall and uh, just game for free, you know, it was quite easy in those days, there was no real security. Yeah, so I went to a lot of gigs with, without having to spend any money, you know, so, which was good. So a lot of bands that way. The number of people talk about kicking the fire doors and the free jail. I know. Surprised, well, look, it's surprised they made any money on the gigs. <laughs> I know. So is it, at this time, are you going out to a lot of the gigs? Well, Mark, Mark and Una were an item when I first met them. Okay, yeah. Uh, we talked about the mid-70s. When, when did you meet Mark? Was that about 74, 75? Yeah, it must have been 74, yeah, looking back. I remember we were, one of the early times we went 
to a gig together. It was to see Lou Reed do the uh, Sally Can't Dance tour. So that was 74, I think. Yeah, I remember we were both in the circle for that. Um, yeah, so about then I met him. Yeah. Kind of got to know him gradually, really, because I was already part of a kind of little gang of mates, and, and Mark was a, a new figure. He suddenly appeared in, in Presswich. It was quite odd. He wasn't one of the local lads because he lived just slightly down the road in Sedgley Park. Okay, and he, yeah. Because his girlfriend, Una, had got herself a flat in Presswich Village because she worked at the mental hospital. And then Mark started visiting her and going in the, the local pubs in Custard Village, and that's kind of when his face got noticed, you know. Mm. So he, I think he was quite sheltered, you know, when he was an early teen. He was a sort of stay-at-home kid, and then he suddenly came out of this uh, chrysalis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in a way, he, came, he joined your gang. Um, yeah, yeah, elements of, of the gang I was in um, uh, formed what became... The Outsiders and then The Fall, because we were already making music. And we, we started out, Mark, Mark was an interesting guy as well, so we started, and he was a year old, oh, he was in the year above us at school, he was actually only six months older than me, but he was in the year above me at school, which is quite a big deal when you're mm. at that age, you know. So there was this older guy from, who went to the grammar school at the road, and he was quite well informed, you know, about music and books and stuff, so we started hanging around with him more gradually. Yeah. So, so, so started books. attempting to make music. So a book's an important part of the equation as well. Did you have time to read books? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah you know, yeah, I read books. <laughs> I mean, was it, was, it, was, it the, was it kind of the classic, you know, that kind of literature you would read in that period? Or was it, was it, was it like unlikely things? I mean, was it, was it kind of all the way from Lovecraft to the Beats to like comic culture yeah. and yeah, underground exactly. magazines and books? Yeah. yeah, it was sci-fi, a lot of sci-fi, like I say, Bits of horror fiction and stuff like that. Uh, we, we attempted some of the more, you know, pretentious literary <laughs> efforts. Mm-hmm. And, but uh, Mark was quite fond of Mark E. Sard at one point, you know, went through a few of his books. Um, yeah, you know, some of the poets and that. We had pretensions to be, you know, to be quite highbrow in our own way. Because again, you know, we'd read, you'd read an interview with, say, Patty Smith going on about Rimbo or some poets. So you want to know what the, the words were, you know, it was about you'd find yeah. out. Get down the local bookshop. We used to do a lot of shoplifting of books, you know. <laughs> what did you do? Was it fast library um, of stolen books? <laughs> <laughs> well, not from that shop. Um, oh God, what's it called? The the hippie head shop by the gallery. Um, eighth day. Uh, not eighth day. No, the one who sold the books and the comics. His name just gone top of my head now. Uh, not Black Sedan, was it? No. No, the guy's. He was always getting busted for uh, putting out comics, wasn't he? I don't know. Oh, I can't oh, think of the top of me. No, it's, got, it's it's right next door to the gallery. You know, when the gallery was right in town, it's the venue. It'll, it'll come to me. He he sold all the all those kind of comic culture books and underground books. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, well. Yeah. So, so, was it was it was this like living? Was it was much Manchester reflected back into this, or was it like you created your own little world, sort of despite Manchester in a way? Yeah. Uh, I suppose both of those things. Like I say, we want, we we knew we wanted to be original in whatever form that took, and we you know it's like obviously there were no no's like you're not going to sing in an American accent because a lot of English bands adopted American accents to sound more rock and roll, you know, <laughs> back in the sixties and seventies. So we knew that was that a basic no no right there. But um, I think it was because we we lived in Presswich and we, up the road we had the biggest mental hospital in Europe, Presswich Mental Hospital. And uh, there was a lot of crazy people around Presswich Village. And I think Mark, suddenly a, a light bulb went on about the angle, you know, like the madness in my area and stuff like that. I think the first song you wrote that kind of captured it was Bingo Master's Breakout, that lyric, because it was about lo- a local guy going uh, mad, you know, one night. And it was told in a very kind of stylized, uh, kind of old fashioned way, you know, the lyrics are quite oldie-worldy in some ways, you know. I don't know what I mean by that. Poetically, I mean. But yeah, that's very press rich, you know, and uh, but it, it still had the element of the avant-garde about it musically, you know, a lot of discord, and it was minimal. <laughs> so, and it's it it's what, so in a sense, it's what they would call nowadays in literature magic realism. It's, it's like mm, re- yeah. real life exaggerated into, mm. into like esoteric spaces, really. The ma- you know the magic and the mundane and things. 
Yeah, because we'd be like sitting in the local pub, but we'd have had magic mushrooms before we went to have a pint. So we'd be observing the locals through those sort of lenses, you know. Mm. And, you know, Mark was good at picking up just the right phrases that uh, captured it in a mm. down to earth kind of way, even though you're talking about being out of your face. So. <laughs> So, so with the outsiders, what what was what was that like? That, that's so that's the first band you put together. It, yeah, that's the first band with Mark and Tony Friel and and and, and Una eventually. Yeah, she was going to be the drummer, Mo Tucker style, but um, she ended up playing keyboards <laughs> mm. for whatever reason. But um, but which at the time this is quite revolutionary. I mean, of course, Mo Tucker's already doing it, but bands were generally then. Just four blokes, weren't they? Lads, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we, 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 yeah, and we were kind of aware we didn't want to be a laddie band, you know. That was another thing we kind of knew, you know, we ought to be a bit more uh, sophisticated than that, I think, to include the female element. Mm. Just to avoid them kind of rock cliches again. But, um, yeah, yeah, so um, probably 75, 76, we were starting to just mess about with ideas. I mean, I, I had a, I had another band called Nuclear Angel, separate to working with Mark, where I, I was the singer. It was very much kind of a Stooges wannabe band, but it, it only we only never rehearsed. There was no way to gig then, really. So it was just mm -hmm. going going down into my friend's uh, dad's cellar and uh, making a racket, trying to ape the New York Dolls and the Stooges, you know. So, uh, so I'd made my first foray, but no one had seen that. I didn't. You know, it was just learning the uh, the chops so somewhere. So with the outsiders, it really did feel like something was quite different was going on here. Yeah, it was a bit more sophisticated, as I say. Uh, the sensibility. It's very much a Velvet Underground vibe about it, like that, that underground feel, sort of arty underground. But uh, obviously... Uh, we're transposed to it. Huh? Yeah, to a, a, a suburb of Manchester with mm -hmm. all, all the pluses and the minuses you get from that, I guess. It's yeah. not New York, is it? So it makes it no, interesting. We were, yeah, yeah, we were isolated. We had, we had room for our imaginations to uh, develop, and, and we were we were uh, unencumbered by any interest from the music business, you know. So we weren't trying to <laughs> please an A and R guy or anything like that. We were just making music, it's purely coming out of our minds, you know, influenced by the people we thought were the best, you know. So just trying to reach that standard that the, the people we admired, you know. But, you know. People at the time that I've met over the years he sort of bumped into you and and, and and you know and, and the band and all that little gang up in Presswich so the atmosphere was very sort of acidic piss taking mm -hmm. quite snarky yeah. and would you say that that was quite true you know if you went round to the flats you really had to you, you really had to be on your toes yeah, yeah Ch we challenging were, yeah yeah, we <laughs> yeah for sure I mean you know, you know that's legendary isn't it that's Mark Smith he made a career out of that persona but yeah, yeah I mean the it, it, it pervaded the whole band, I suppose, at that point. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we were difficult, intentionally difficult. We thought, you know, it's like everyone's asleep but us, you know. We have to wake yeah. people up. <laughs> the, the Arrogant, yeah. Tale. yeah. Hubris, the bounds, you know. <laughs> so so in many ways, his... In a healthy so, way. Yeah, of course, he makes great yeah. art, doesn't it? I mean, the, the persona he ended up being quite well known for was, was an amalgamation of the personas of the people in that kind of group at the time he was le yeah he was learning fast mark obviously because he did, i wouldn't say he took it that seriously to start with it's all a bit of a lark and then um the, the penny dropped with him he started to take it quite seriously quite soon after our first couple of gigs um and um, he developed yeah he developed the, the famous marky smith persona which was it became in the end he like created this monster and had to become it it's quite strange because mm. he was it was a, it was kind of I mean, he was always, you know, as you say, snarky and, and uh, liked to make fun of people, he could bully people when it suited him. But he was kind of, he had a sensitive side. He was quite, um, could be quite uh, feminine in some ways. You know, he was quite considered and thoughtful and soft, you know, he had a soft, uh, but but he, he created this, um, i say this Mark E. Smith persona when he added the E to his name, which wasn't there initially. <laughs> he thought he needed to. Literally, yeah. Because he, having a surname like Smith, he thought he had to, Give it some kind of distinctiveness, Mark Smith. I didn't think people would remember that. So anyway, um, and yeah. So at first it was just uh, he put it on for uh, for journalists and you know gigs, and then he had to live up to it. I don't know. He kind of became it, 
I mean, you know, it's brilliant. It did really well out of it. But um, it was strange to see the development of all that. Yeah, I mean, also, I always think that with Johnny Rotten, it must be quite hard work in your mm. 60s ha- having to be the pantomime yeah. dame or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Every, every day, every time you go to the shops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and people expect you to live up to it when you, you, know, you just want a quiet time somewhere or whatever and you've got to turn it on for people and imagine. So creatively in that period, were, were you the main creative driving force? I'm just kind of guessing here. I don't know, it's not for me to say. It was a kind of collective musically. Uh, as that first fall progressed, I became the, the driving force musically. Because um, I was the, the only, I was the longest serving of the original members. So, uh, you know, I was the only one that stayed there for um, two years of the active life of the band, the first two years. So I quickly became in charge of the music. You know, I had to teach any, anyone new who joined the existing songs, you know, write parts for them. Um, yeah, arranged stuff. Yeah, I, I, I slipped into that role for probably the last, the last year of the band, more than from the very beginning. Tony Friel wrote some of the early songs. Una wrote one of the two. So, yeah. initially, you, I mean, the initial songs, I mean, they're great, and they do have that kind of fantastic warp to them. But then you kind of hit on this thing with the repetition thing, which is what which is what the four got known for. One of they, um, the kind of, the riff that gets played over and over, but it just keeps morphing and changing. But it's somehow the same, but different as it keeps going. So, so yeah, do, you, yeah. do you remember the day when was this something like it was just yeah. a natural process, or was there a day when you thought, "Fuck, that sounds good"? <laughs> you know, when you hit the groove, the fall yeah, groove, or whatever. I mean, that that was a kind of yeah, yeah, that was a good composition in the sense that t- Tony just Mark had this idea of repetition, you know, lyrically. And Tony came up with a two-note bass line, basically. And um, I just started playing that riff. It was just a spontaneous thing. I didn't sit down and work it out. It, it, you know, I was probably influenced by stuff like Pete Shelley's solo in Boredom, you know, that two-note solo. Mm-hmm. At the end of Boredom. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, I've already seen Buscox at that point. And um, so I, I knew it had to be something simple. <laughs> Tony had already done the two note bass line, so I just came up with that riff. You know, we play that song a lot, so it starts morphing and you play with it within the repetitiveness, you kind of improvising a bit a little bit as much as you can get away with. You. So so was there a lot of yeah. sort of playing was there a two way process with the lyrics and the music playing off each other? Or or were you just not always aware of what Mark was singing, he probably wasn't always aware of what you were playing, or was it very much that you know you were taking ideas from each other and bouncing off each other. Yeah, as far as me writing with Mark, he usually just had some words on a bit of paper, you know, and um, I'd mess about with the idea, you know, get some chords in there, maybe arrange it a little bit so there was a, a chorus or something, you know, it wasn't always a set piece, you know, it's just some words. And then we'd start jamming it and it develop a little bit more. We'd think, oh, we could start it like that. You know, it's an organic process. So, um, but usually, most of all, song started with Mark had some words, you know, because the words were important. But having said that, I was I was working on ideas for songs anyway. You know, I'd be at home laying down instrumental tracks, thinking Mark will come up with something for that. He'll like that, you know. Give him a cassette. I'd let him on a cassette recorder you know, and Mark a cassette with some bits of music on, and he'd, uh, you know, things seemed to slot together naturally. There'd always be something that suited, you know, two out of three of the ideas at the end of the fall song. You know. So there's different ways of working. There always is, you know, sometimes you've got a great <coughs> riff, a great piece of music, but then you've got to think of some words that are appropriate. Or you sit down and write some words, as you know yourself, and then uh, arrange some chord structure around that. Or turn up at the band rehearsal and the band are jamming some good groove and you, you just have themselves some new lyrics in your pocket. Mm. And you've got a song before you know it. You know, it's a, a can approach, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing how happen chance it all really is. <laughs> Mm, yeah, there's lots of ways of doing it, you know, yeah, so. and and I use all all methods available really over the years, you know, and we did then as well. So. so when you initially went out playing in Manchester, what was your reaction like? I guess it's there's probably two ways this is going to go because one people wanted a, a version of punk they totally understood already, and yeah. the other way is that because it, the because the fabric had been ripped slightly, people are actually up for anything 
So, I mean, or is it, you're just landing somewhere in between the two of those. Um, yeah, we got our style reaction. We kind of invited as well. We were quite confrontational on stage as well as, uh, you know, just in bars and things or with the, our general circle of friends. But um, some people loved it. Some people hated it. We kind of divided people. I mean, our first gig was at the uh, Northwest Arts in the cellar. They had a cafe in the cellar. And um, the week before, I'd seen Pete Shelley in the ranch bar. And I went up to him and said, I'm in a pump band. <laughs> We're playing next week. You know? So he turned up with uh, Audi Vato and the manager, Richard Boone, to our first gig. So, um, yeah. And the, the next gig was actually supporting them in London because they enjoyed it. You know? so, hmm. But uh, that was very confrontational because we were obviously really nervous. You know, it was our first gig. Um, it, was, it was actually recorded, but God knows what happens to the recording. A guy from the Mekons recorded it on a two-track TIAC. Anyway. Uh, and that there was no keyboards at the first gig. It was just guitar, bass, and drums, and Mark, yeah. and uh, Mark doing lots of pointing. At how do you it seemed? <laughs> <laughs> it's only a little room. You can imagine. You know. <laughs> Start as you mean so, to go uh, on. Yeah, <laughs> that went down well that night. Yeah, but the next few gigs it got more confrontational because we didn't look so much like punks. You know, we didn't have the punk uniform, and mm. that put people off. And songs like Repetition, we had a few slow songs in the set. A quiet number, you know, so we weren't like three chord punk all the time, although we had that album too in the early days. So we were just a little bit more varied and we didn't quite have the uniform. So the hardcore punks kind of took a Guinness, you know, especially when you know things we got a lot of cans and <laughs> gob thrown at us, you know, but every band did then. But um, we'd just grind repetition on even longer if they weren't liking us, you know, we just making <laughs> yeah. them have it. So that was a good number for that. It could go on for ten minutes or whatever, you know, just to piss people off more. So, so, so you're, you're yeah, actually. I mean, we, we, we loved albums like uh, we had uh, like a, a great album for us was the, the Stooges' Metallic KO, which is all about yeah. a really disastrous gig where Iggy's uh, bottled by a biker and passes out on stage. So we wanted all that, you know, in our <laughs> naivety. We wanted that kind of violence and confrontation. You know. Is that, I mean, that is, that's kind of taking the snark thing to its extreme, and it? it's that you are so yeah. <laughs> you're so certain you're right. Everyone's just going to have to come with you, whether they like it or not. Yeah, yeah I think you got that attitude, haven't you, to get on in rock to some mm. extent. Well, you did back then, anyway. That's for sure. Yeah, well, it's like you're either doing art or cabaret, so you have to you have to decide pretty early, mm. don't you? So, um. Yeah. But did people start picking up on it? I mean, obviously, yeah, Shelley and Devoto and Richard Boone liked it, but what, what was there other people starting to turn up and starting to get it? Yeah, I think that's it. it, it, it we appealed to journalists and, and just people who thought a bit more about music generally because we, we were a bit more varied. There was obviously more influences in what we were doing than just the immediate British punk thing. For whatever reasons, just because we were listening to a lot of different kinds of music and, you know, listening to it in you know, states of mind, as I said earlier. So that was seeping into the music, the minimalism, and the you know the de deconstruction of things. And so you know, Paul Morley was an early one to champion uh, early fall gigs. He wrote some good reviews of us, and uh, yeah, people kind of took us seriously straight away. You know, say the more intelligent journalists. I think they had something to get their teeth into as writers. You know, so yeah. And then, and then we of course, John... we weren't surprised. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and then, then of course, John Peel picked up on you. And you, you first recordings were the two Peel sessions, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. So, well, we, we, the first recording was actually the Bingo Masters Breakout EP the year before, oh, okay. but we didn't get that yeah. out. We couldn't get a record deal for that for like a year. So, uh, so our second outing was doing those two Peel sessions, at, you know, at it, what... studio outing. I mean, studios in the 70s are very different places than they are now. Now, the, the engineers can understand a lot of different ways of making music, but I remember going to studios in the 70s, early 80s, and they, they didn't have a clue what you were going on about. I mean, was that the same for you as well for early recordings? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the engineers and stuff were a different generation of musicians and uh, music, you know, their ideas were kind of, very based in the 60s and early 70s, you know, what worked in heavy rock, what worked in pop. Um, and, they, you know, they didn't, they didn't appreciate these 
naive kids coming in and thinking they knew better and uh, not knowing how to play in tune properly. I mean, for instance, I like um, Rebellious Jukebox, I had a bass line that was in a major key, but the chord over it was a minor chord. And it's like this engineer, his ears told him straight away, that's that's wrong. You can't do that. And it's like, but we're doing it. You know, it's like, yeah. so with it, yeah, there was that kind of conflict. It's like, you just can't do that, kids. It's not the way we do things. It's like, well, you have to have the, the courage to stand by your convictions. I mean, Rebellious Jukebox wouldn't be the same song if I suddenly put in a, a ma- an E major rather than E minor, you know. So, you know, and, and you, you always get used to it, but we, there was a lot of discord in, in the, the compositions, you know. It's really effective. That engineers didn't appreciate it. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's the first thing I remember really liking that, that, that you did, that the, the way things were slightly out of sync and out of key. It, it, it provides mm. a, a strange wooziness, doesn't it, and an oddness and off kilter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's just the way my mind works. You know, as a guitarist, I, I like Discord. I like the space between notes. Uh, you know, like you say, you get that weird, uncomfortable feeling. It's like the, th- the theremone, you know, that weird instrument where it just glides between notes. That's what makes it so strange. Mm. Uh, and I played the guitar like that. I like Fingermaster's Breakout. That's most probably the most out of tune guitar I ever played on a record. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it on purpose, but people think, oh, I just couldn't play. I was just a punk rocker, you know. But I mean, I, I took that out of tune as far as I could up the neck, you know. It was just, it was a statement. So, so you, you actually were technically a pretty good guitar player, or did you just you just knew what you needed to know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, know, I was it? learning. I was learning as I went yeah. along. I wasn't technically good. No, I was I was a primitive guitar player, but I just had the big imagination, you know. Hmm. I had and, an original take of what I did with what I knew. It was what made the difference. I, I knew I'd, I'd take, I'd, I could get a strip ideas down, so I'd, I'd just take two notes and I'd treat them like they would like maybe two drums and just play, use these notes percussively. And I'd save the chords like they were the big ones, you, you know, you just use a chord for a big impact. So it wasn't like chords all the way through. It'd be like, how, how, how much my arm's going to get at least two notes? using them as an interesting way rhythmically, you know. I kind of like some of the jazz guitarists and things like that as well. No expert on that, but I, I just always preferred the, the sort of discordant sounds and more complex In relations. Al- you know. Almost like a discordant minimalism. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's it. That's what it was. Which is quite amazing, actually, isn't it? Because even with hardly anything's in there, you still manage to keep it discordant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a guitar tuner either. <laughs> oh, no one had that. You had to tune by ear, which is insane. No. Yeah, like, <laughs> how, do, how do people it, yeah. do that? <laughs> so I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just get, get hoping for the best, wasn't it? So what, yeah. what was it like doing the peel sessions then? I mean, a lot of people had problems doing peel sessions at that time, but were you okay? It was in the deep end, yeah. We were okay, yeah. I mean, we were well rehearsed, really. And... Um, we knew what songs we were going to do. We knew them well enough. And uh, but the first peel session, our bass player refused to come on the day. You know, I've probably told this story before. But um, for for the reason was the guy who was going to drive us there. We, we needed a driver to drive the van. So it was a friend of our manager, Kay Carroll's. This guy said he'd come if you could play congas on the session. So he, he, we didn't have to pay him if you could just play congas. So and he's wearing this Hawaiian shirt. He's not very punk rock. He's you know, kind of got long hair, Hawaiian shirt. He's got set of and so our bass player at the time eric we went to pick him up and he's like who's this, who's this person uh you know if he's if he's coming i'm not coming and it's like well he's coming so i'm not coming like, okay <laughs> so we drove <laughs> off without him and uh so i borrowed a bass from somebody else and uh I to, so i think my point of the story is i had to play the bass and guitar on the first peel session so it was in the deep end in that sense for me uh, and the vocals, backing vocals as well. Did a bit of vocals on Rebellious Jukebox and stuff in those days. Um, yeah, so it was a busy day. Uh, basically, I just, me and Carl were like so tight. Carl Burns, the drummer, uh, you know, we were so uh, just in the pocket with our sound by then. So I just we played live in the made available, you know, studio. And then I just overdubbed the bass afterwards. So we played guitar along with the drums and then just overdubbed the bass at the end of the session. So, yeah. Was, the it, was the band quite hard working? Did you, you rehearse a lot? 
yeah, we did well. We just enjoyed playing, yeah. So, yeah. I'll just find somewhere to rock up and plug in and play, yeah. We're just mad for it. Mm. So the experience you took from the Peel Sessions, did that inform the debut album as well, the way you recorded it? Yeah. The, the, um, we had the same producer. We got the guy in who'd done our two Peel Sessions. Was it Bob Sargent, I think his name was. Oh, yeah, he did a lot of stuff, like monochrome set. He'd been... Mm. Well, he did our, our album as well, Live at the Witch Trail, oh, yeah. because we liked the sound, we liked the way it worked. And he had this, um, he used to hire this uh, Eventide harmonizer effect, which um, Bowie used famously with, for like Iggy Pop uh, on The Idiot and um, on, on Low. Eno brought it in, I think, to their session. So it was this state of the art. It's kind of a pitch shifter, but it was like a chorus. It was, it, it was very complex. We could do with it. They used it on the the snare sound on low to get that, boom, you know, that really that sound of the eighties. It became that snare sound, you know, to transform mm -hmm. pop music in the eighties. But low was the first place you heard it, and to some extent on the idiot as well, baby. But and um, but he was using it with us. He brought it into tuning the guitar because the guitar was always sharp. <laughs> because um, the guy who got the guitar off had hollowed out all the frets. It's a bit technical now. A la uh, Richie Blackmore, he, he'd hollowed yeah. out the gaps between the frets, the wooden. Because Richie Blackmore did, uh, and, but it meant I, I could if I it was uh, playing too hard, if I was you know squeezing too tight, I'd make everything sharp, you know, because <laughs> there was no wood to, to yeah. stop me pushing the strings. So it's like I was bending the strings every time I played a chord. Anyway, so I, I was naturally going sharp, and he, he was wise enough to know this, and that's why he, brought, he hired the Eventide harmonizer, and put it on the guitar on which trials, and he had done it on the Peel sessions too. And that was kind of what gave me that unusual sound on which strand. It was, uh, it was kind of chorus before there was chorus, really. I think there was early chorus pedals, but the, the harmonizers like cost thousands of pounds, you know. So he just hired one. Came in a suitcase. It was a big thing, you know. Yeah, the, and it was, they were amazing effects, weren't they? You know, when it, when it first yeah. came in, it was it was like science fiction in a sense, wasn't it? Mm. <laughs> he, he went to town on that first peer session. He put it on my vocals on. Um, Rebellious Jukebox again. If you hear the Peel version, you, for one, you can hear the congas. That's the only track that actually has congas on it from the driver. And the, the other thing is, you put that uh, even tied harmonizer on my back on my vocals, uh, which it, it, it's really extreme effect, which we didn't do on the album because it was just too much. But yeah, that's. that's but, what, but with the album, was it also quite deliberate to not have lots of effects on as well, apart from yeah. the harmonizer? Yeah, well, like, we recorded that in a day and we mixed it in a day. You know, we, we booked a week in the studio, but Mark got ill. It was, we were in London and Mark lost his voice. And uh, because we played live in the studio, we couldn't play because Mark had lost his voice. <laughs> we needed the vocal cues and stuff, you know. And um, so we just sat around for five days, me and Carl dicking about in the studio, going to the pub. And then Mark got his voice back. He went to see a Harley Street specialist, actually, who said it's, it's psychosomatic. Really? <laughs> yeah. It, it was fear of making the album. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's what the doctor said, psychosomatic voice. Gave him a spray and some tablets and bollocks, you know, told him to gargle with honey and what have you. Anyway, his voice came back, and we, we recorded the album on a Saturday and mixed it on a Sunday, if I remember right or a Friday and a Saturday on that. I days. guess that adds to the urgency mm, <laughs> of the sound. Yeah. 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 And he was got it, the line that... in. He got the line in as well. Uh, I had a psychosomatic voice at one time. It might come back. Oh, that was on Underground Medicine. That was actually yeah. about the, going to the doctors that week. So he just threw it in the song, you know, very much. Yeah, yeah, I caught another line. So it's, um, but it's actually, it's, it's not a rudimentary album. It's quite complex, isn't it? I mean, some of the rhythm patterns, some of the playing. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not prog, but it's almost that, that kind of level of, um, it's not three chord thrash. I mean, there's a lot of dynamics going on here. Yeah, that's right. I guess so. Yeah. Um, Carl was a great drummer uh, and he mm. listened to a lot of prog. He, he, he didn't really like punk at first. He was a mate of mine uh, uh, from way back. I've known him since I was about 13, Carl, just locally. And um, he took to the drums really naturally. You know, I was there when he first sat behind the kit. It's a long story, but he could just play. He was like that. It's kind of just pick up the sticks and could play. And um, but he was listening to stuff like Rush, 
his, his favourite band because of the drummer in Rush. So he liked that kind of heavy prog rock. Uh, he liked things like Thin Lizzy and stuff, but he didn't like this new punk thing. Uh, but we needed a drummer, and I said to Mark, come and listen to Carl. He's really good, but he might not want to do it. But because uh, we had a gig coming up in London, the second gig supporting the Buscox was in London, and we needed a drummer because the guy who did the first gig was a, just not good. You know, we didn't get on with him, and he wasn't a very good drummer. So, but, and that was the carrot for Carl. You know, he got to go and play in London. So we, Carl joined the band, give him an haircut. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to get your haircut at that point. <laughs> We all got then, our own um, between the Sex Pistons, you know. <laughs> yeah. Wow, it's a big cultural sea change, wasn't it? It was, yeah. yeah. Get, get your mum to uh, take, your, <laughs> take your flares <laughs> off your pants, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah stitching in your trousers. Yeah. I, mean, I learned stitch from doing that. <laughs> so, and then, and then the band goes through a few lineup changes, don't you? People like Mark Riley join. I mean, was there a sense that it was a difficult band to be in, or was this just a natural ebb and flow of members that most bands have? Yeah, well, it was a difficult. We, we, yeah, it was a difficult band to be in. It was an intense environment. Um, yeah, I mean, Mark Riley was rodeoing for us. I think he was only like sixteen then, but he came to that uh, first peel session. He was our roadie, and it was after that. It was in the van on the way home that we, you know, said, "I'll teach you the songs. You're the new bass player." Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but yeah, you, I mean, bands are hard, can be quite intense things generally. For, but the fall was always difficult because the decisions being made didn't always make sense on the ground at the time. You know, so people would get their noses out of joint over things they thought were wrong ideas. You know, but uh, I don't know. There's a million reasons to leave a band or be kicked out of a band. But if a band's going to keep going, you, you just go and look for fresh blood and carry on. I mean, who's, who's making decisions? Was it collective or was it? Dom dominant personalities well obviously uh, mark became the dominant personality obviously um initially on the outside was, yeah initially it was perceived as a collective you know that was the idea it's this great pretensions of being a kind of collective whatever that means you know kind of but um i think when, once Kay carol became the manager and she was also mark's living lover and manager and she was encouraging him that he was a genius and you know that switched the balance because then the manager was always in Mark's corner, mm. and that's why Tony Friel left. Uh, Una soon after, and then Carl, you know, and then I was the last one standing from the original <laughs> lineup. And then, then I'd had enough, you know, because Kay was like nine or ten years older than us, and she was starting to, you know, act like a, 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 too much of a mother, you know, mm. uh, you kind of working class Manchester mother. She was quite bossy, quite in your face, and in an unnecessary way, you know. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and and Mark could do no wrong. So that's the that became the dynamic. But it, I mean, it was great for Mark because the next lineup when when he had the lads in, you could call them all those Catholic lads. <laughs> yeah. uh, then it, then he's, he could you pursue his, his vision single mindedly, and it was a great thing, you know. Who knew mm. what was in store, you know? So I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of what they did, you know. How come you stuck it out for so long then, or the longest of the originals? Oh, well, because it was, a, I really enjoyed it, really. You know, there's a lot of pluses about it. Uh, me and Mark were really good mates, you know. Um, mm. So it was, like, it was our thing, you know. But then mm. it, it was that that last two years, well, the first two years of the fall, but the kind of last two years of a, the, the, the sort of original teenage friendship was very intense. And, uh, you know, our egos were both expanding you know, exponentially. So, uh, you know, we came to blows a couple of times, and I just, you know, I just told him I'm leaving. I had enough at that point. Said, the details don't matter really, but it, it was actually when Iggy Pop played um, the Russell Club, the Factory, as it was then, um, on his on his New Values tour. In, yeah, and uh, we we were both went to see that, and, and I, that's when I told him I was leaving that night. Yeah. Mm. Well, but yes, yeah, we just fell out. I think it was very intense, and I'd had enough of him. And Kate, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, she she was probably worse than he was <laughs> to deal with. Yeah, he learned he learned a lot from me. That was like the final piece of the jigsaw for Mark. You know, when mm. he finally got rid of Kate, he, he'd, he'd taken on a lot of her persona in a, in a male form. Mm. You know. Yeah, I, I can see that actually. 
So, so from the, Kay was from the same Manchester as me. Kay was from Openshaw. So I, I, I really, on some ways, I mean, Kay were really close. I got on really well with her. But she was just, the whole thing was too much, the combination of the two of them. Mm. Yeah. So I got a, a lot of time for Kay, I must say. She was a home girl in some ways. Yeah, it's just just the dynamics of being in a band of people is different. Yeah. So, no, I mean, like you say, yeah, they, they did brilliant work together, didn't they? And, and so, mm. so they, after was the decision yeah. straight away to go make your own band, or, or was it, or did you just want time out? I mean, I, I, yeah, well, it's a demand thing, but it took time to get together. You know, to so sort of jump off the roundabout, start to jump back on immediately. I mean, I was very lucky to get another chance with Blue Orchids uh, at Rough Trade and stuff. <clears throat> it took a few months, it didn't take forever, but it took a few months to get a band up and running with a, a sound that wasn't just the fall again. Mm. I mean, Tony Wilson was a good friend at the time as well, you know, and he was just starting factory records. He wanted to sign Blue Orchids, but I had the option of Rough Trade in London, so I, I went for Rough Trade for whatever reasons. So, you know, I think obviously we just made a really good album and people obviously thought my next band would be going concern and worth looking at. So we did have some good options. Mm. How but difficult to... I, I went to do something yeah. different again. But um, I mean, how difficult was it to do something that didn't sorry. sound like the fall? How difficult was it to not sound like the fall, even though you're one of the prime architects of the fall? Yeah. Would you find yourself I, actually I, stopping yourself doing what you would normally do? <laughs> yeah, that, for ages, there was an element of that. Like I was tying one hand behind my back, not doing what was natural, you know. Well, you know, just I was trying to be, every time I write a song, I'm trying to write something different from the last batch or whatever. But so it wasn't, you know, a totally impossible task. But yeah, I was, I was consciously trying not to sound like the four. So, yeah. <laughs> but then it, it depends. I mean, sometimes, I mean, now I don't care anymore. You know, for years I've not worried about that. But when, in the eighties, I was definitely trying to sound, you know, go in a different direction somehow. I think one of the keys to it is um, actually literally pushing the key keyboards up to the front of the sound. Wasn't it? I mean, of course, the fall had keyboards, but a different style. This is a different way of playing, and a very constituent yeah. part of the sounds. Yeah, well, the fall had a cheap electric piano. When Blue Orchids had a cheap organ, so you can hold the notes on an organ. Mm. An electric piano is more percussive. And that's the main difference, I think. It, 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 we, we bought this cheap Elgin Snoopy, the cheapest keyboard in A1, music shop in Manchester. It's the cheapest one, and so that's the one we bought for Una. And that was played uh, on the first few Fall albums, I think. I think Mark Riley played that as well, the Elgin Snoopy. And, um, but in, in Blue Orchids, we bought the cheapest keyboard in the shop by then was this Yamaha Holden with just three tone settings. Three, three draw bars, uh, very basic organ. So that I, mean, I, I love, I love the uh, sort of hollow sound, you know, so fluty or any. Anyway, so we had an organ. That was the main difference. <laughs> were, were you always fascinated by keyboards because they they were unusual at the time, weren't they? I mean, most bands were guitar based drums, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's a strange one because in some ways I wasn't really interested in keyboard music myself but I, I suppose um the fact i had to learn to work with keyboards because we bought this album snoopy so you have to start arranging and writing and things about keyboards and then you know Una obviously played keyboards in blue orchid so that continued i mean the bands i would have liked were kind of uh, you know i love the stooges i mean the velvet underground had some keyboards in there things like sister ray and stuff there was organ on so and Modern Lovers, I loved the first album. I had a lot of organ on it, but a lot of the music I liked was just you know guitar driven rock. So uh, yeah, I had to get used to the idea of keyboards in some ways. But you know, the, now it's a I get it, you know can't work without them. I just love the the colour they add to the sound. You know, mm. but it was a process of getting used to how how to work with them in a in a, a way that wasn't cliched again. You know, because it can sound very serious. If the guitars aren't playing power chords, there's more space for keyboards in the Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So 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 what what caused the Blue Walkers to unravel then? Because it was it seemed to be going really well initially, didn't it? Mm. Yeah, well that's a, a difficult question. That I don't want to sort of blacken people's names. 
But, um, you yeah, know, again, I hate to keep going back to the drugs, but we were doing a lot of drugs now, different drugs. By, by that point, it was a lot of uh, speed and cocaine and weed. But then uh, when we, we started working with Nico and then the heroin became available, uh, and half the band became heroin addicts and, uh, and carried on working with Nico. And uh, I wanted to stop working with her after a year or so. Because it's like Blue Orchids had, had a name. We'd got our first album out. We, you know, people were taken seriously, but we were starting to be perceived as Nico's backing band. You know, and I thought that was dangerous for me as a songwriter, as an artist. I didn't want to be, you know, uh, this public perception is quite important. And um, I didn't want to be seen as part of the Nico scene. But like our bass player and drummer were perfectly happy. It's like it was a bigger gig, you know, she's a legend and they were happy to be a bass player and drummer. Yeah. And so there was a split there. Um, yeah, but people are getting a bit crazy because they're doing too many drugs as well. I mean, I, 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 I never I say I never became a heroin addict, but I, I did badly overdose in the early days when I was trying to see what it was about because I didn't really like, I, didn't, I couldn't understand the fuss about heroin. I tried it and it didn't seem that, great it's like what's the deal about this and so i was always being told well you've not had enough you need to take a bit more and then you'll get it so one day i, I took a shitload and poisoned myself and i was really lucky you know because I, I couldn't stand stuff after that so yeah. I, I never got i never got to the addicted stage but in that window of those few months uh was when i just i was doing big headlining gigs in london and a and r guys were coming and i'd be like puking into the monitors because I just done a line of heroin before I went on stage, and yeah. you know I, I didn't use a needle or anything, but it was just freely available. So I went through a brief flirtation with that. Probably when I should have really had my act together, I was like arrogant and out of it. You know, a bad combination. Thinking you're great, and th thinking you don't need to really try hard anymore because that's the, the heroin influence. Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck. You know, to me that's all it did. It made me feel like I don't give a don't give a shit. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, I thought, well, I don't really need heroin because I feel like that anyway. It's like, no. Punk, I don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah, but that, that's kind of so we were relevant because of all the drugs we were doing. Uh, that's where the blue office had collapsed. We, we were falling out, as I say, over the Nico thing. Una got really ill as well. She had to be, um, she had to go into hospital. She, she became anorexic, she's very thin. Um, so yeah, things we went to the extremes of the drug culture. Yeah. What was it like when Nico turned up? I mean, nowadays, obviously, Manchester is such a big, multicultural, famous city. It wouldn't be a big deal if anybody moved here. But that mm. time, I remember people saying, Nico's moved to Manchester. People go, what? <laughs> yeah. What's she doing here? <laughs> I got a phone call from Alan Wise, you know, mm -hmm. a famous Manchester promoter. He was managing Blue Orchids then. But it's before he got involved with the fall. He was Blue Orchids manager. And... Um, he just phoned up at Blue one day. He, was, he used to run rafters, this club. And he said, have you heard of this German woman, this singer called Nico? I was like, what? Nico? You mean the Nico? He wasn't, he didn't really knew who she was, Alan, you know. <laughs> Bless him, you know. He, but he, he wasn't, he didn't really like rock music. He just liked being on, hanging out and running clubs and just collecting yeah. money, having a crack, you know. But he wasn't like, he, he thought rock music was a bit of a joke, you know. So he didn't really know the Velvet Ground well, he, he wasn't familiar with all the members of the Velvets. He would have heard the name. You know, it wasn't. Anyway, yes, yeah, so I was like, double take. You mean Nico from the Velvet Underground? You know, I was a massive fan since being a teenager. You know, I had all, all the records she made. And he says, yeah, yeah, she's in Manchester. And she's just down the road from you. She's looking for a, a band. You know, she needs a band. So uh, he, he came around, drove me around to the Polex Hotel in Wally Range, which was just down the road from where I live. And just took us into meet Nico. It was just a cheap Polish hotel, you know, the Polex. And uh, there she was, yeah, the legend, <laughs> <laughs> holding court, sort of thing, on this double bed in the Polex hotel. <laughs> and uh, we got on, you know, so uh, we started, uh, became a backing band and a support band. We'd do two sets, we'd do our Blue Orchid set, and then we'd go on and do Nico's set. So that worked quite well, it was economical, and we, we, we toured Europe and UK with a few tours over that year or so. I can't remember exactly the time, the window in time, but yeah. You know, well, how did she end up in Manchester? I can't, I can't quite remember yeah. the story now. No, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it, I don't know how or why. I mean, it was a cheap place to live at the time. I don't know what she'd heard. I don't know her reasons. Also, cheap heroin, I believe. I mean, the heroin was quite new on the scene. It coincided with Nico turning up, funnily enough. 
<laughs> it's not a drug we would be offered or we were looking for. But then suddenly it was. Suddenly ordinary kids were taking heroin, you know. And it, was, yeah, it was very bad for Manchester, obviously. Uh, mm. yeah. But uh, I don't know why she why she arrived in Manchester. I never really asked. She just did. You know. I, uh, she had Alan, of course. Alan uh, became her manager and looked after her. And she needed a lot of looking after, you know. She needed a certain kind of person who put up with a heroin addiction and the requests, you know. So Alan was that guy. He, he loved her in his own way, you know. Sort of really devoted a lot of time and effort to keeping her alive and working, you know. What, what was she like as a person? Was she talkative or was she quiet or intense, yeah, brooding? I'd, I'd share uh, like a minibus with her to go to gigs and, you know, post gig, we'd have a lot of talks driving through the night round. She was fond of t- reminiscing when she was nicely stoned in the right space, you know, she'd like, quite often be telling you about uh, oh, various famous boyfriends, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know uh, you, you know, Brian Jones and Bob Dylan and Iggy Pop and Jim Morrison. And she'd tell you all these tales, you know, when she was, say, when she'd reach mm. that nice sweet spot of being stoned, you know, she'd have her and then she'd have a pipe of hash. And she was, <laughs> in her element then you get the best out of her but um, yeah so she taught she told me a lot about her, her life and stories and, and those sort of drives and stuff in the night you know. was she interested in, in you and your background as well yeah she was I mean to, to her we were kids you know and uh, mm. like she, she had these suede boots with a, a low heel and she was like why have you got no heels on your boots? You know? <laughs> Get some proper boots with Cuban heels. It's like that. No, oh, these are the latest thing, Nico. You know, this is the look now. <laughs> um, but she was my, my mo- I had a really young mother, you know, so she was actually more or less my mother's age. So I, I, I you know, there was a big age gap, but we, we got on well. Mm. Um, and she, she, she was the only person who gave me some advice about singing. She was like, when, when you um, hit a low note, imagine it's a high note. When you hit the high notes, imagine it's a low note. <laughs> that was stuck in my head. I don't quite know. Uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to work it out. <laughs> yeah, don't strain your voice when you get the high notes. Yeah, I'm still trying to work it out. Bit of a zen there from me. So, so, so after this period, was it was it a sense that you just had to like try and get yourself together? You see? Yeah, yeah. It was a it was a crazy time. As I say, you know. Um, um, yeah, I've already talked about some of the issues. I don't want to go too much into personal uh, difficulties. But um, yeah, Jeff Travis at Rough Trade, he wanted me to move to London and work with session guys. I was staying loyal to my band in Manchester, but then within weeks, my band in Manchester was dumping me for Nico. So I was, <laughs> I was, I'd, I'd lost that offer to go to London, which I didn't really want to live in London at that point anyway. But the, the, the kind of guys that I was standing by, um, were suddenly telling me my idea was a bad idea and they'd rather be Nico's backing band, you know. So, yeah, so, I mean, from there we did get another uh, drummer and uh, bass player in. Uh, but, I don't know, things ran the course, you know, some bands don't last long term in that way. Uh, we'd already had quite a few pers- personnel changes. I mean, the you know, the, on the first single, The Flood, and Disney Boys, we had uh, we fired the first bass player after that first single, and then uh, we, we fired the first drummer after the second single. You know, so <laughs> things which, yeah, and then you know, then the bass player and drummer left for, and then we did Agents of Change, and then uh, me, me and Una were falling out, so our, our, our relationship split up. Uh, you know, so I'm thinking, what should I do next? I, I didn't want to. I was sick of the whole thing, you know. So um, I had a break from that, and, and, and uh, I met Carl Burns, who was not in the fall, and we started a band called Thirst in the mid '80s. We put out uh, a 12-inch EP on Rough Trade as well, um, but that was kind of gloriously doomed from day one, you know. So we didn't have keyboards. We were going back to our rock roots. We we're going to be a guitar-driven band, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was, it was a pretty wild. Pretty wild band, actually, but we, we didn't have a lot of uh, critical success or acclaim. I think things were just starting to go the Manchester way, and we were kind of getting very American rock, so we weren't that mm. cool. We went on point. I you saw know. you play, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and then so me and Carl fell out after a couple of years of that. And then I, 
bricks left the fall and I thought, ah, oh, I'll phone Mark up, see if he wants to do some writing. Well, it was like nearly 10 years since we'd fallen out. Were you still All speaking in that 10 years or was it? No, no, we hadn't really, we, we'd bump into each other here and there, but we, we you know, no, we weren't really talking that much. I mean, we I, I know you said, rivals. yeah, I know you, you, you said before that, you know, he was difficult, but you liked the records and that, but was it kind of odd listening to, the, the, the template of the fall, and it's not like the first album sounds like every single fall record, but there's, there's definitely a lot of the hallmarks run yeah. all the way through the fall right to the end. Yeah. You know, the way you play guitar, the way you play those really catchy, slight out tune lead bits, the rhythm guitars, the way the bass is, the whole thing is, mm. is you're, you're a big architect of that. So it must be quite odd listening to the fall and not getting the credit for it in a sense it must be annoying <laughs> yeah it was really annoying but I got, I'm, I'm so used to it that's been my whole adult life is putting up with that so I'm kind of used to it it's my normal you know it's, it became my new normal at some point in the mid 80s but uh, yeah I think things like uh, various times are a template for the, the whole of the Falls catalogue you know that, that song various mm. times uh, that yeah had elements of repetition but we developed it more and uh He's sort of grinding out a bass riff and the various improvised elements over the song. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of over it. I'm used to it. It's uh, not bitter. <laughs> what can I well, say? It's, yeah, there's not much you can do, is it? Sort of. No, yeah. no, it's, uh, you got, you got to get used to these things, otherwise it'll drive you mad. You know, you go fucking, sorry, you, get, you go balmy with the bitterness, won't you? you know, and bitter and twisted. So was this the first time you spoke to, spoke to Mark for about 10 years or? Yeah, more or less. I mean, we were both still living in Presswich. I mean, you know, I can't remember how often we bumped into each other, but we weren't hanging out anymore. Definitely not. Um, but I, I just I, I just got into my head. I, I still had his phone number. He still had the same phone number, you know. He hadn't moved around much. So I just phoned him up out of the blue and said, uh, hey, Mark, you know, fancy doing a bit of writing. And he said, yeah, come around. So I <laughs> just went around with my guitar, wrote a few tunes for the fall. But, but then uh, then he said to me, do you want to rejoin the band? He says, because uh, he, he didn't immediately say, come back in the band. You know, first of all, I was just doing some writing with. And then he says, uh, do you want to rejoin the band? You know, uh, Craig and Steve think it's a good idea, but I'm not sure, he says. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Is it as if Craig and Steve ever get to have it? Saying who joined the band, but that's, that was the fact he was being canny about it. You know. So I said, Yeah, 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 yeah. It was good money at that time, 89. They just signed to a Polygram, so big deal for them. So, uh, yeah, so I said, Yeah. And then he, he seemed to spend the next year punishing me for having left the first time, you know, just <laughs> constant wind up all the time. But I was determined sure. I wasn't going to leave. <laughs> so he fired me. And then, Surely you could give as good as. You got from him though, since you, yeah, you're both in the same the, snark school, aren't you? That was part of the problem, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I wasn't a yes man because to me, he was still me, me old mate, where so everyone else he was the boss, you know. I mean, I, mm. I, I tried to be respectful. I mean, I didn't want to lose the job, but I could only put up with so much, you know. Mm. We had a, we had a fallout in the studio while we were doing the White Lightning EP, that Dredger EP, I should say, with the White Lightning single on it, and uh, we had a big fallout one night. He, yes, anyway, and I, well, not going into all the details, but that was just before we went to Australia because he, he, he sacked me that night, but then I got reinstated again because the Steve mediated. But then we were going to Australia, of course. By the end of the Australian tour, I was out on my arse. You know. <laughs> I mean, what was the dynamic in the band like? Quite different from the original lineup, I'd imagine. Yeah, everyone was like just on tender hooks. If, Mark was in the room, or if Mark was even coming down the corridor, you know, it's like this element of fear and dread all the time from the band, yeah. It's quite heavy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can see it. Get... Fear-based adrenaline, you know, and everybody's speeding, of course. It was like required medicine in the fall. Everyone had to have a line of speed before we going on stage, at least. Most people were having speed for breakfast with a lager, you know. <laughs> on tour, that is, obviously. So, you know, it's like you just go to... Go down to the bar for breakfast, you know, have a line in your room, go and have a lager to wash it down with, and then you're up for the day and repeat the process as needed. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's Mark's <laughs> life. Yeah. Try, try to keep up with him. Never tried to keep up with him, but uh, that's Mark's life. You know, he did that pretty much all his adult life. You know? 
And that's amazing, he, amazing how far he got, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so that's amazing how long he lived with, in the end. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, he's a, he's a strong, strong character. What's the dynamic between you and the rest of the band, not counting Mark? That lineup of the fall, the extricate fall. We, we, we'd, we'd gone really well. We knew we, we had a good, tight band at that point. It wasn't because we weren't any good that I got fired, you know. Um, we, we were literally locked in, you know, me and Steve, Hanley, Simon. We had a good rhythm section. And then, um, yeah, we, we were a great live band at that point. It was a big sound, you know. Uh, yeah, and, and Marshall on keyboards as well, very talented. Isn't, isn't that part of how the unravelling started? Was it something with you, Marshall, or something? Or? Yeah, that's, that's, it was a personal thing. Uh, yeah, I, I was starting to see Marsha. And Mark didn't like that at all because apparently Mark had designs on her, which I didn't know. I always seem to be stealing his girlfriend's. That was his perception. It wasn't my intention. <laughs> I seemed to think that, you know, I had a bad track record for nicking his birds. <laughs> I'd imagine it's that plus he would see that's going to be a camp in the band that he can't yeah. penetrate. Uh, quite I think literally. it was that I, I still had a claim to the fall, you know, when, once I was back in the band and an original member, that somehow I, I could, I was getting too much power. I wasn't really looking mm. for it, but I was just getting it. That, that, you know, the other people in the band respected me as an original member, you know, because Craig and Steve had been fans before they joined as kids. Mm. So they thought it was great. But so, I, yeah, a lot of the power yeah. was going on. A lot of insecurity, power plays and... So yeah. yeah, so so after after that, were you? Did that wear you out on the idea of being in a band? <laughs> what? Sorry. After that experience, was it like? Was it was that were you kind of worn out with being in bands? Oh, it, it was. It was, it, was it was a real. It was a real shock personally because you know to get fired in on the other side of the world. I mean, the band were going to go into Japan, and I was really looking forward to going to Japan. So on a personal level, it was a dirty trick, and you know it's like I literally had a letter at reception when I came. It was the last gig on the Australian leg of the, this tour. And I'd been out, you know, clubbing, come back at 3 a.m. And there's a letter at reception for me. And it's Mark telling me, you know, I was fired and there was a one-way ticket back to the UK. But it had all the band and, and the entourage, the road crew and everything, had been moved into another hotel across Sydney, across town. So I couldn't even knock on anyone's door and just say, what the fuck's this about? You know, all that. Mm. No, one, no one to sort of uh, talk to about it, just this letter, plane ticket for eight. 30 that morning and it was already 3 a.m so it's like do we get on the plane or do i just go and look for them and strangle mark you know <laughs> <laughs> so sensibly yeah i got on the plane went home and then um, yeah i didn't know what to do with myself at first but thought so uh better start another blue orchid crack on you know <laughs> right, so I, I got some more manchester musicians in and you know did yeah, we had a, a guy had a couple of lamps of blue orchids in the early 90s that were doing quite well at some point in the mid 90s i just got sick of uh, the whole thing i needed, I needed a break I, I kind of wanted to just uh, get a, a, a job <laughs> a steady job and just get the act together and uh, you know i was in my mid 30s by then and i've been in rock bands and doing the drugs since my teenage years you know the fall were successful really quickly uh, so yeah so at some point, I mean, like, we, we blew up his tour within spiral carpets in the early 90s and stuff. So, you know, we were, we were working. Mm -hmm. we made an album uh, that got shelved for like 10 years because we couldn't get a record deal for it. So it was just hard to get a record deal. And in them days, you couldn't just self release, you know, effectively. You know, you need to get a label behind you to do it seriously. And uh, being X4, the, the music business were kind of put up with the fall, but X4, they just didn't want to know about any. All X4 members really struggled, you know, for whatever reason. Mm. So, yeah, so by the mid 90s, I kind of, I was living in, I moved to London as well after leaving the fall. Well, about a year after, actually. But. So, I had a Manchester Blue Orchids, then I moved to London, started another band in London, another Blue Orchids. And then uh, mid 90s, I just knocked it on the head and lived in London for about 14 years and came back up north in the Northies. So, what, what job are you doing? What, what was then? Yeah. A number of different jobs. Uh, I've never stuck at any one job for very long, you know, mainly blue collar stuff. I, I never went to university or anything, so I've always been like uh, just done a minimum wage type work, I guess. I worked mm -hmm. at Neil's Yard Remedies for like four years, 
which they were quite posh hippie uh, uh, natural cosmetics company. I worked in the warehouse there, but then I got promoted to uh, export administrator, an office job that was quite good in the late nineties. Then I got sick of that. I ended up as a bus driver for London General. I was driving the big red double deckers around London mm. in the early noughties. And that, that was very stressful, long hours and dealing with the public. It's quite dangerous. <laughs> At night, you'd have like 200 quid in change and you'd be in the middle of some council estate. And, you know, the local smackheads would see that. So yeah. there was a lot of mugging of drivers and stabbing. And all that. So it was a, that was a dangerous job, but it was interesting. So another side of London. Then I got a, a job delivery driving for this laundry company around London. Multi-drop delivery, picking up laundry, dropping off laundry. Again, you get to see another side of London because you know different route every day. You know the different towns within London, different suburbs. And... So yeah, you learn a lot. So I enjoyed brought, London. So what brought you back up to Manchester then? Was he just were you homesick, or was it just was this about the time you start playing with Steve? Again. No, no, it was years, that was years like that. So I worked with Steve Hanley again. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm at the early noughties now, right? So I'm delivery driving around London. I've, I've done my bus driving. I've done me working for Neil's Yard. I've uh, I also worked for the Music and Video Exchange in Notting Hill and Camden, which is a famous shop for London music heads, a lot of second hand vinyl and stuff. Worked there as well for a while. Um, so now it's the early noughties. I've lived in London for getting on 14 years and uh, I've got loads of different jobs, but I'm always skint because still living in London is expensive, you know. So, um, I, I don't, you know, I'm a northerner. I just, at some point, I knew I was going to go back up north. So, uh, yeah, so I got to like 2003, 2004. I just packed my belongings into this old uh, Volvo I'd picked up in, uh, and, and just drove up the motorway to, to Macclesfield. I got a little flat in Macclesfield initially. And was driving for a reaver in Macclesfield, driving buses there for six months. But then uh, eventually I moved back to Manchester proper, got a little council flat in North Manchester. And, um, and then I did a, a solo album at home. <laughs> and after that, and now we get you know, a few years are going by now. So I think I released that solo album, The Battle of Twisted Heel, in 2008, just self released on CD. Um, initially, although it was reissued a couple of years ago on vinyl. But, um, so then, anyway, right, so I've made this solo album. I decided to do some gigs as a solo artist. I'm going to go out with an acoustic guitar and kind of reinvent myself as a folky. <laughs> you know, I'll do for folk music what I did for rock music, you know, <laughs> whatever that is. But anyway, <laughs> I did a couple of gigs and I thought, I'm not Bob Dylan, this isn't going to work. It was a nightmare. Uh, so I thought I need another band, and that's when I started Factory Star in uh, the end of 2008. And uh, 2009, and, and Steve Hanley called me about this time, said, you know, it'd be interesting to work. With him and Paul would be interested in working with me. So we, we joined Factory Star Mark II. F Factory Star Mark I was the sand, at the Sandells uh, rhythm section, Manchester Sandells. Yeah, yeah, I remember them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so then I worked with the Hamlets for a year, but we didn't, we didn't actually make a record, unfortunately. We, we fell out before we got to do the album. It was a good band, oh, though, that. It, 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 yeah, it was yeah. great. And I, I love Steve and Paul, and it was great, but I mean, we were gigging pretty regularly, and we sounded really good. But um, and of course, we thought we'd put a couple of fall songs in the set to uh, please the fans who were turning up you know, to see Steve and, and the rest. But we got that. We got really knocked for that. Like, it's like, can't you stand on your own two feet while you're playing false songs? It's like, well, we fucking wrote them, you know. Like, we're only <laughs> yeah. doing like two at the end of the set. But it's like, oh, you look at them, I'm going to play false songs. But we didn't have to, we just thought people might enjoy it. But um, so there's a lot of more fall baggage, I, I keep saying when I explain this. There was like three times the fall baggage than I was used to. Uh, and, and, and Steve got us this gig at a spoken word festival in Larn, you know, the Larn Festival mm -hmm. in West South Wales. Um, Richard Thomas. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's kind of a D Dylan Thomas thing, isn't it? Mm. Literary festival. Well, they wanted us to turn up and be, do an interview about our lives and music and play some fall songs acoustically. They, they pitched this to Steve and he was, he was like, that's a great idea. But it, I'm like, well, who's going to sing these fall songs acoustically? I, I, I'm going to be Mark Smith, am I? You know, Mark's still alive, also. <laughs> Point. And I thought I'm going to get absolutely panned for. Them. I'm going to get no thanks. And to do them acoustically, so they sound weedier, and to try and be 
do justice to Mark's material. I mean, I'm not Mark Smith. I, you know, wouldn't attempt to be, especially not in an acoustic situation. You know, where you haven't got the power to even back you up. So I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Steve's like, we've got to do it, man. It's great. It's great. You know, he's, he's a good friend. He's a good friend. And it's, it's, it's taken seriously. This festival would be really good. We could do an interview. We'll drive down, do the interview. We'll play a few songs acoustically. I'm like, nope. Because they wanted a false set. If it had been our own stuff, I'd have done it. You know? but, so we fell out over that. So Steve says, well, fuck it. I'm leaving the band then. So I said, all right. Yeah. Mm. Good riddance. <laughs> and then the next morning, he phoned me up and says, oh, I was a bit hasty, you know. I, yeah, you know, I'm sorry about that. And I'm like, oh, it's too late, mate, you know. <laughs> next if you want to mention, you know what I mean? Now you know it's like to get fired. So <laughs> we're friends since, but yeah, we fell out. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't let him back in the band that we'd left the night before. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> it's silly dynamic, isn't it? We're good friends now again, but yeah, we fell out at that point. And I just got another bass player and drummer and straight away and carried on. Made mm. uh, Enter Castle Perilous, the first Factory Star album. Well, and what happened to that then? Is, is that, do you hit the That's same kind of problems? Or, Sorry. you know, what, what happened to the band? Well, yeah. Factory Star lasted about four years. We, knew, we had about three or four different lineups. We made two albums for uh, on the Occultation label, a, band, a label in Exeter, funnily enough, but uh, they were into putting out our products. So. And then uh, after four years, actually, what happened was um, they started to do these John Peel festivals as tribute to John Peel, you know, after John Peel passed on. And somebody asked us if we'd do a Blue Orchid set for one of these John Peel uh, festival nights. Oh, night and day? Uh, no, the first one was in Liverpool, actually. Okay. Night, Night and day, uh, I think that was the same year. We did three on, on, on the run that year. I think it was 2012. Um, yeah, we did one in London, one in Manchester, one in Liverpool. All those Blue Orchids, just doing the classic Blue Orchids set. And, um, and then, then people wanted to book us as Blue Orchids again. And, and, and Factory Star were kind of struggling. It's, it's hard you know, to keep changing your name and, and keep trying to have the same success. So, you know, I, I bloody-mindedly decided I was going to be Factory Star, just to be different and have a fresh start. But you know, um, when people want to book Blue Orchids, you know, it's just the road of least resistance. It was business-wise, it made more sense. Blue Orchids is a stronger brand, I guess, and I, I've, I've got to learn to live with it now. Mm. I'm trying to escape. Well, it's, it's your vehicle. It's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got the My car vehicle. keys. <laughs> yeah. I know, exactly. It, it's just it had baggage attached to me psychologically, you know. It's like, you know, just wanted to put it in the past at one point. I'm over all that now. So do you find yourself now in a really curious position of having one of your best lineups of the band? And this this is actually, this is not the tail end in a way. I know we're all getting older than that, but this is actually, this is actually a chance for the Blue Orchids to actually do what should be done in the first place. Yeah. The, I, 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 the I, I, mad like, drugs aren't there anymore. The, the erratic lineups aren't there anymore. It's, this is actually a solid unit now, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. But still with the creativity. Yeah, like yeah, I'm a late developer, I think. <laughs> a very late developer. I'm, I'm more, I'm more um, sober these days. Um, I'm kind of over the drug thing. <laughs> but, um, and I'm more focused. I, and I've learned a lot. And um, I'm, a, I'm a mature writer now. I've not, I never sold out. I've not kind of lost the reason for doing it. I'm not trying to please a and guys or, you know, the business. So I write for the pleasure. And, the, you know, my experience is starting to, to show. In imaginative ways, you know. So it's uh, yeah, it's a very good time. It, it, this is the best lineup at the moment, and this new album that'll be out in um, four months now uh, is a, is a stormer. It's really good. It's got loads of energy. Is it a different dynamic to the way you work as a lineup? Because I mean, obviously, I've known Vince for like about forty years, and mm. he's a very talented musician, a, a yeah. great bass player, but also a good writer as well. So yeah. I'd imagine this is not just a pickup band. This this is um, th this. There's a lot of ideas in the mix and the mesh, and yeah. a very and a collection of very creative people. Yeah, definitely. I never have a pickup band. I always uh, bring people in, and they contribute. You know, I work with the people I'm working with. I work with their talents. Mm. I, I, when I was young and first writing, I used to write every part for everyone. Now I don't. I, I write the basic bones, and then I let people just join in and make a part for themselves. You know, I'll guide mm. them or whatever. Or, to come up with something brilliant, and I go, that's, you've nailed it. You, you know what I mean? So, I, I, and I've always been like that. I've never had a pickup band of just guys doing what they're told. I always bring people in and listen to what where they're coming from and weave that into the sound, you know? So, mm -hmm. it, 
it's, it's always changing that a little bit because of that. But yeah, but this this is a strong band and they all contribute musically. Yeah. Well, when you say it feels like your strongest album, is it what what the hallmarks that make it strongest album? Is, it, is that melodically or sound wise, dynamics, tension, or, or everything? It's a mixed bag, but then quite often Blue Orchid's albums are. But um, it's got a very live feel. It's very immediate. And there's more improvisation going on. We've got a new lead player. Um, and there's just that element of improvisation that makes it sound strong and fresh. You know? It's quite immediate. So, yeah, we're what, five teams now. And, what, and that's out, well, is that you're saying in a couple of months? Or is it? Yeah, we're actually announcing it today. It'll be coming up on social media. Tiny Global are doing the announcement today. But they're, they're planning to make it a digital download, I think, in four months, and then a month after the vinyl will be available. So it's going to be out in the late spring. Brilliant. And well, it, well, thank- you know, say so myself, it's a good album. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but usually... Anybody right. who's in a prop, proper band's their own worst critic, aren't they? <laughs> so if, if you know it's good, then it must be good sort of thing. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, well thanks yeah. that, Martin. I'm very, I'm very yeah. critical. I'm, I, I, I hear all the mistakes. You know. I, I hear every little mistake. I find it hard to listen to like live recordings because I just hear all the mistakes, you know. Mm. Uh, but I'm not... I, Studio albums. I mean, I, I, I love them all, but the, the new, the new ones are always the best one. I'm always uh, like, I'm seven songs into the next album now. The next new one, obviously coming out at the end of the year, um, and that's the best one. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I'm just into what I'm writing at the moment. So, mm. uh, but you know, see, yeah, it's a great album. Speed the day. Uh, I think it will be it'll please our existing audience and should uh, impress a lot of new listeners too. You know, it's got strong elements. I think. Mm. Good strong rock album. It's got imagination. It's got uh, off the wall elements. It's, like I say, it's it's quite wired, you know. Mm-hmm. Spontaneous, more spontaneous lead going on, maybe on this record. I'll look forward to hearing writing, it. If I say so much. Huh? I'll, I'll get John Henderson to send me uh, a link. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're doing all that in the, in the coming weeks. It'll be given to all the. Relevant journalists, etc. For sure, mm. he's been keeping it under wraps. I said we recorded it in July, but um, with the, the COVID issues and also went for vinyl. You know, when you turn in the pressing plant, uh, and you know all the other factors means it's, it won't be out until the spring now. But it's worth the wait. So we've been keeping quiet about it because we want to do it right. It's going to be a good, strong release. Brilliant. Well, well, thanks for that, Martin. Thanks for your time. Yeah.